Hello friends, my name is Janice Mitchell and I'm a pelvic health physical therapist. Today we are talking about internal support. So what does that mean? Internal support of what? Well, stay tuned and we're gonna go into a lot more detail. Pelvic floor muscle training is one of my favorite topics and internal support can make a huge difference in those people that may be having pelvic organ prolapse, pelvic heaviness or pressure. So much of the time, this diagnosis of pelvic organ prolapse is terrifying. Or if you feel a vaginal bulge or you see a vaginal bulge or you're having any of the other symptoms of prolapse, uh, people think, ah, help, my organs are falling. I'm here to tell you that there is hope and help and there's some simple things that you can do to help live your best life. Before we get started, just remember that I am a physical therapist, but I'm not your physical therapist. This information is not medical advice for you. Be sure to get evaluated by a qualified healthcare provider before starting any program. There are some red flags, which are basically warning signs. And so if you have any of these red flags, make sure you get checked out. So if you had trauma or a fever, chills, night sweats, unexplained weight loss, unexplained weight gain, altered mental status, which is uh, confusion, not being oriented to person, place, or time, and then depression or suicidal thoughts and unexplained pain or bleeding. This concept is a very simple concept, but uh, it's not something that I think we really think about a lot. So the forces from below must equal or exceed the forces from above or the organs will start falling. So this is an example of a pelvis. Here, this, this ring here is the pelvic bones that are kind of like a bowl. And then you have this mesh, which are your pelvic floor muscles. So if you think of your pelvis like a bowl, the bones are the outside, the bottom of that bowl are your pelvic floor muscles. So they're named very appropriately. And then you can see that they have organs that sit on top. So they're kind of like a hammock stretching from the front to the back of that bowl and side to side. Let's look more at the anatomy. So we're looking at her internal organs. Basically, she is cut in half down the middle from the front to the back. And then we're just looking at one side at the internal organs. So it's kind of like a hammock, this stand. This is the pubic bone in the front and the tailbone in the back. And then this net here are your pelvic floor muscles. And then that's the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum sitting on top of the pelvic floor muscles. So let's go over a little bit more of the anatomy before we get started on all the details of internal support. And I think you're going to love some of these demonstrations that I, I uh, am going to share with you today. It took me pretty much the whole day to take these pictures and to edit them and to send them to my computer and to save them and upload them to Canva. Woo! It was quite a process. But I'm very, very excited with this information and I'm very much of a hands-on learner and I hope that you also will like seeing this hands-on information that we're going to share. So going back to anatomy, the forces from below must equal or exceed the forces from above or the organs will start to fall. So the forces from below, the three forces that we're talking about are the pelvic floor muscles, the fascia and the ligaments and the bony structures. Here we are again looking at this female that's cut down the middle and we're looking at the inside of her right internal organ. So this is the belly in the front and the bottom in the back. Here's the pubic bone. These are the abdominal muscles. This is the tailbone and the spine. And you have the pelvic floor muscles stretching here, connecting at the pubic bone and then going all the way back to the tailbone. And here are three organs that uh, females have unless they have had uh, their uterus removed. So we have the bladder here where urine exits. This is called the urethral canal. This is the uterus and the vaginal canal and then the rectum and the anal canal. Now watch these pelvic floor muscles again. 
So as they squeeze, the pelvic floor lifts and it actually even lifts the organs. And when they relax, the organs lower and the canals open. So let's watch that again. Let's watch the bladder, the urethral canal here. So as it squeezes, the, that canal closes and the bladder lifts. And then when the pelvic floor relax, relaxes, that uh, urethral canal opens and the bladder lowers a little bit. And then I think it's important to talk about some of this other anatomy here. And, and the anatomy is so important for you to really connect with. And I'm gonna be showing you this same side view with different tools throughout today. So you already saw the little hammock stand, right? And then you have a real person here with a schematic here. And then I'm, I actually have a little model that has Play-Doh and Mardi Gras beads. So we're just gonna have a fun time today with different models. But here is the clitoris. And then this is the vulva. And then this right here is called the perineal body. And this is what gets torn when you have a perineal tear during delivery or if you have an episiotomy. So that gets that gets uh, torn or cut. And then you'll see in one of the slides today that the tear can go deeper and it can even like from grade two to grade four it actually goes into the pelvic floor muscles and you have several layers of pelvic floor muscles and the grade four uh, perineal tear actually goes all the way into the rectum and into the anal canal there so that's a very severe tear and we want to avoid that okay I'm getting back on track so the pelvic floor muscles are kind of like a trampoline so it's kind of like this bouncy structure at the base of your pelvis. Think about what happens when you jog or you jump. The organs kind of go up in the air, right? But you have to land. And when you land, that pelvic floor needs to be able to absorb that impact. So it absorbs and then it comes back up. It absorbs and comes back up. Here is an example of a trampoline. So here is the pelvic floor muscles. You have the bones on the outside and then you have these ligaments holding them up forces from above. So we talked about the forces from below and right now the forces from below, those forces are what you have inside your body already. Uh, the topic that we're discussing today, internal support, is going to be supplemental support from below and you know that's an exciting concept. So anatomy, forces from above. We have gravity, the pelvic organs, the organ content, so what's at, whatever's in the organs, and then intra-abdominal pressure. These are the four things that we're gonna be talking about today. But again, if you think about that pelvic bowl, the pelvic floor muscles are on the bottom, what pushes down on those pelvic floor muscles? Well, all of these things do. Gravity, so we've all felt the effects of gravity, whether or not you've been on a roller coaster or not, but you have that G force, you have that gravity force. Think about the space shuttle and those astronauts, that incredible force. Uh, even if you've been in a car and you take off suddenly, so you have this, this force. So gravity is this constant force that's pulling us down. And so for the most part, gravity is good, right? If we didn't have gravity, we'd all be floating around in the sky. But gravity does take a toll on our bodies and it takes a toll on our bodies different ways with different body parts. So here you can see gravity and uh, loose skin here. It's kind of pulling down, right? And we look at this and maybe we don't want that kind of tissue or that skin kind of hanging down and drooping, but we're not terrified of this either like okay well so maybe she had a baby or maybe she had some other life event that has caused uh, the skin to be stretched out and kind of loose but it's not it's not something that we are terrified about right most of us look at this and we are not terrified it's a normal part of life to have tissue and body parts that start to sag a little bit and to droop a little bit it's not terrifying so when most people hear the words pelvic organ prolapse, they're horrified and they are scared and they're worried about what their life is going to be like. But let's just go back here. When you see breast sagging, is that terrifying? Are you horrified? Are you worried about what your future life is gonna be like? What about a sagging belly? 
Are we terrified? Are we horrified? Are we worried about what our future life is going to look like? No, we can do things to help support these tissues. And the same thing goes with pelvic organ prolapse. So let's look a little bit more. Here is our little hammock. Again, this is the bone. Here are the muscles and then the three organs. And then here we have muscles that are starting to sag. So you can see this position and then these muscles are drooping and the organs are starting to droop. Organ contents. So again, the, those pelvic floor muscles are holding up the organs. If the organs are empty, they don't have as much to carry, right? If the organs are full, there's a lot more to carry. And so the three organs that we're talking about are the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. So what does the bladder hold? Well, it holds urine. What does the uterus hold? It holds babies. And then what does the rectum hold? It holds stool or poop or bowel movement, whatever you want to call it. And so if these organs are empty, again, there's less, less pressure and less weight that the pelvic floor is having to carry. And if they are full, there's more. Does that mean you should never fill your organs? Of course, that is not what it means, but it just means to kind of pay attention to your body. And if you notice that you're having more symptoms every time after you eat a huge meal, well, maybe you don't want to eat all at once. Maybe you want to space your food evenly throughout the day or, you know, talk to a nutritionist, a dietitian about um, <laughs> meal plans and so forth. But I think the key part here is just connecting with your body and seeing if you can have, uh, be like an investigator. Is there cause and effect of the symptoms? Intra-abdominal pressure. So this is kind of, these are really big words. And what does that even mean? The pelvic floor muscles are part of the core. And you have four basic muscles that make up the core. You have the diaphragm on top, that's the diaphragm. You have the deep belly muscles, you have the deep back muscles, and then you have the pelvic floor muscles there on the bottom. And here's another side view where she's cut in half. So there are the pelvic floor muscles. These muscles work together to help stabilize. It's kind of like a canister. So you have the top, the bottom, the front, and the back. And so they stabilize what's inside the canister. And so what is inside the canister? Well, we have the spine, we have the pelvis, we have the pelvic organs, and so these muscles help to modulate uh, pressure and forces required in normal everyday movement. So how do you know if something causes intra-abdominal pressure? Well, let's try a few little samples here. Go ahead and I want you to cough, cough into your arm. <coughs> And now I want you to put your hand on your belly just above your pubic bone. So in between your belly button and your pubic bone and kind of press in. And now I want you to cough again. <coughs> and now do a baby cough. <coughs> and now do a big cough. <coughs> Can you feel the difference in that activation of your abdominals? Well, that's one indicator that that's a higher pressure. Uh, another example would be walking versus running. So if you're walking, you put your hand there on your belly and you'll feel some tension in the pelvic, in, in the abdominal muscles rather. But if you're running, those muscles have to be even more engaged to help stabilize that high impact. Um, so basically that's a summary of what intra-abdominal pressure is. Anytime we're moving, we're having some intra-abdominal pressure. There's little, a little pressure or a lot of pressure. And again, listen to your body. And if big movements of, of intra-abdominal pressure are causing symptoms, maybe um, scale back on those activities if you can. So what is the definition of pelvic organ prolapse or POP as we like to abbreviate it? Pelvic organ prolapse is a disorder in which one or more of the pelvic organs drop from their normal position. It is caused by injury to the muscles or tissue that support the pelvic organs. Here we go again. Here's our hammock stand. Here are the pelvic floor muscles. Here's the bladder, uterus, and rectum. And by the way, if you don't have a uterus, that is fine. Uh, but the same concept of the structures and how they function still applies to anybody that may not have a uterus. Or if you don't have a rectum or a bladder, uh, that's rarer, but it still does happen sometimes. So 
here are the pelvic floor muscles and then you have your three organs and then here are the pelvic floor muscles that are stretched out they're lengthened they're overstretched and then we have pelvic organ prolapse where these organs are starting to droop now uh, let me just caution you that you won't if you look at your vaginal canal whether you if you have prolapse you're looking for a vaginal bulge you're not gonna see a yellow bulge you're not gonna see a brown bulge because I'll show you with the anatomy it's actually the vaginal canal that's kind of collapsing uh, with the organ behind it so you won't actually see the organ is hidden behind that wall here we have this female side view again anatomy pubic bone tailbone bladder uterus rectum pelvic floor muscles that stretch front to back here we'll go over the different types of prolapse this top one on the left is what is considered to be normal so there's no prolapse and then gradually you have a sequence of increasing prolapse so let's actually look at the anatomy here here's the vaginal canal and then that wall is called the anterior vaginal wall this wall is shared between the bladder and the vaginal canal they share a wall and so here in this grade one the bladder is starting to collapse a little bit into that vaginal canal and then in a grade two it's collapsing more into the vaginal canal grade three is collapsing even more and then a grade four it's collapsing all the way down so something to uh to keep in mind is that there was a study that showed that 75 percent of the people in that study had a grade one um, pelvic organ prolapse without any symptoms so it's way more common than we think and a grade one actually may be the normal position for a lot of people so now we're going to talk about the posterior wall, also called a rectocele. So again, here is no prolapse. And this time we're looking at this posterior wall. That's the vaginal canal. And we're looking at the wall here that it shares with the rectum. Here's a grade one. So the rectum is starting to fall into that vaginal canal. A grade two is falling more. A grade three it's falling even more and then a grade four and it's coming out of the vaginal canal but again remember it's covered by that vaginal wall so if you saw this prolapse you would not be seeing uh, your actual rectum you are seeing the vaginal canal that's bulging with the rectum behind it apical or uterine prolapse so again no prolapse and here we're looking at the uterus so this would be a grade one, it's starting to fall a little bit. Grade two, falling more. Grade three, it's coming out there right at the entrance. And grade four, it's actually prolapsed outside of the body. And rarely, especially in these higher grades of prolapse, do you, do you see that it's just one organ alone that is prolapsing. So if you have this level of prolapse of the uterus, chances are pretty high that you're going to have other organs involved. So you can see the rectum there and the bladder there. And now we have multi-compartment prolapse. Again, no prolapse. Grade one, everything is starting to fall a little bit. Grade two, it's coming down. Grade three, everything is coming down. And grade four, uh, all three organs are starting to collapse. Now, this is what I've been working on today, you guys. So what is this? Ah. All right, so remember, that's why it's so important to remember the side view of the anatomy because this doesn't look like anatomy at all, does it? Here's our female, she's cut in half down the center and we're looking at the right internal organs. So here is the pubic bone in the front, the tailbone in the back. Here is the bladder, and that's where the urine would exit. Here is the vaginal canal, and here's the uterus for sex and childbirth. And then here's the rectum. And the rectum is quite a long structure that attaches to your intestine. So I left it open in the there. It goes way more, way, way more than what I have showed here. 
Uh, this structure right here is the perineal body. So remember that smooth area of skin in between the vaginal opening and the anus. And that's typically where, uh, like with a perineal tear or with a, uh, an episiotomy that that might get cut or torn. So now you get to see pelvic organ prolapse. So here's that anterior wall and that's the vaginal canal, right? And so the bladder is starting to collapse there into the vaginal canal and that's actually a grade four prolapse. So understand that all of these, I'm going to show you a grade four prolapse, but it's very, very possible to have symptoms and to have much less of a prolapse, like a grade one or a grade two or a grade three. I personally have pelvic organ prolapse. I have a grade three cystocele, which is that bladder that's falling down into the vaginal canal. And I've had it since the birth of my first son in 1999. So that's probably a whole other video, my, my journey. But basically, I have personal and professional experience with this topic. All right, now we have the rectum collapsing. So what is that called? It's called the erectocele. So remember, that's the vaginal canal and that's the posterior wall and there's the rectum and it's starting to collapse down. And we do not want these structures to hang out or collapse down, right? We want to keep them up and in their proper places. And then this one is where the uterus itself is starting to collapse down. Again, that's a grade four, it's coming all the way out, but there's much more mild forms of prolapse that we typically see. And now we have multi-compartment prolapse. So all of the organs are starting to fall. It was a little tricky kind of navigating these beads, but they did quite well. And this little experiment here cost what? Maybe $5. We have the Play-Doh, we have the beads, and I had a poster board that my daughter had used in a class project, and I just flipped it around. So it was a fun project, and I hope that that kind of helps to demonstrate the, um, the anatomy of pelvic organ prolapse and how, how it looks as the organs are kind of falling. Okay, so now what do we do? Let's say you have pelvic organ prolapse and you don't want to have it and you don't want the symptoms. What, what is next? Before I go over what is next, uh, there's some really exciting research from a study. I believe it was uh, 2010. And so the research showed that they went through this six month pelvic floor muscle training regimen. Okay, they went through the six month pelvic floor muscle training regimen. And at the end of that um, six months, 74% of the people that had prolapse were no longer symptomatic, meaning they didn't have the symptoms of vaginal bulging and pelvic heaviness. So it really, really does work, pelvic floor muscle training. Um, and some of them even reversed one grade of prolapse, which is also exciting. So I think I'll do another video on that. But but the point here is that yes, there's a lot of options that we're going to go over here, but pelvic floor muscle training is a great and very effective conservative option that I strongly encourage you to consider. And internal support can be used with pelvic floor muscle training. So it's not one or the other, it can be both. And then also we have uh, external support here. So you can do pelvic floor muscle training, external support and internal support. And I do have a video specifically on external support on YouTube and all the different options there. So check that out and I'll link it in the captions here in this YouTube video. Okay, back to pelvic uh, organ prolapse interventions. You see how I get off track a little bit, but such is life. All right, so surgery. I'm not a surgeon and I'm not here to talk about the wonderful things about surgery or how surgery happens and all the different types of surgery. I would recommend that you talk to a surgeon and specifically a urogynecologist is a surgeon that is 
has ultra super training in pelvic organ prolapse. There have been many, many people that have found wonderful relief with surgery, but there are some side effects with surgery. And like with any surgical intervention, you really need to weigh the pros and cons. Watchful waiting. So basically that's just doing nothing. That's not doing anything proactive. And the research here shows that, oh man, I wish I had the statistics right now, but about 40%, I believe, stayed the same. They didn't get any worse with their pelvic organ prolapse. And then close to another 40% actually got a little better uh, over a five year period. And then I think less than 20% actually got worse. So the chances are if you have pelvic organ prolapse and you don't want to do anything, you could choose this watchful waiting and you'd either stay the same or possibly get a little better. But uh, I'm here to advocate proactive, a proactive approach to pelvic organ prolapse because watchful waiting is just kind of sitting back and not doing anything. Let's be proactive and address the symptoms and get you to live the life that you want without the symptoms and without potential negative side effects. Okay, so internal support. There's something called a pessary and there's actually research on pessaries to show that it, they do help some people. Then there's something called pessary-like devices. So uh, again, I'm going to go over these options with you and by no means are the things that I'm going to share with you today all inclusive. There may be, in fact, I know there are other options out there, but these are the options that I have available and that I'm going to share with you. Then we have pelvic floor muscle training, we have external support, and then we have other. Let's talk about internal support. Okay, so supplemental support from below. Supplemental meaning that we're adding support. Your body isn't supporting those organs on its own. You're having symptoms of a vaginal bulge or pelvic organ prolapse or pelvic heaviness and we need to uh, support those organs and you're looking for an, a conservative option here are some great opportunities so there are a variety of devices and i am going to show you each one of these devices something to remember is always follow manufacturer's guidelines. Every one of these products has a list of instructions and each list of instructions are different. So I'm not here today to go over all the ins and outs of the manufacturer's guidelines, but there are things to watch out for. So is this device causing you pain? Pain is a warning sign and a red flag stability so when you put the device in does it stay where you want it to stay or does it move around does it slide out so stability is one uh, one factor support is it giving you that support that you need internally function are you able to do the things that you want to do with the device in urination so can you pee when you have the device in or is the device so intense or positioned in such a way that it cuts off that urethral canal where the urine exits and you're not able to urinate well again that's a red flag and we don't want that same thing with defecation or bowel movements so does that device kind of cut off the bowel movement the the rectal canal there and you're not able to have a bowel movement uh something to pay attention to Ease of use. How easy is it to insert it? How easy is it to take it out? How much does it cost? How easy is it to access? Are you able to go to your grocery store and pick it up? Do you have to order it from halfway across the world? Where do you get it from? Or do you have to have a, a, a doctor referral and get specifically fitted and have your insurance cover it? You know, there's a variety of factors. And then also from an environmental standpoint. So is it single use and you're tossing it, which is worse for the environment, right? Or is it multiple use and you're able to cleanse it and keep reusing it? 
There is not one device that is the answer for everyone. And I would like to preface all of these demonstrations by saying that I have my own personal bias here with what works for me. So I'm going to share with you what works for me and what has worked for a lot of my patients, but I'll also give you anecdotal information about other devices and so forth. Uh, but again, this, these next demonstrations, you're going to see different looks on my face. You might see a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And again, that's just my personal experience. If you are using that device or you want to try that device and it works for you, I give you a thumbs up. That's fantastic. So don't let my expressions or my thumbs up or my thumbs down say that it's not a device for you. It might be. And with all of these, work with your healthcare provider. So generally that's going to be your women's health provider where you go for your GYN exam or possibly a birth provider. Um, most pelvic health physical therapists can guide you through these. When we talk about pessaries, so we're gonna get to that section, there are certain countries where the physical therapist can be trained in actual fitting of the pessaries. I have not gone through that training and from what I know, um, it's not available to us in the USA at this point, but there are other countries. Like I have a good friend in Australia who went through training and she's um, she's fitting pessaries and she loves it and she's uh, having some really good outcomes. So just know that pelvic health physical therapists can help guide you here, even if they don't do the direct fitting. Okay, and I'm kind of gauging this from the least amount of support to the most amount of support, um, kind of, not really. Some of these, some of these are interchangeable, but here we go. Okay, so Poise Impressa, they have three sizes. So this is a size, this one right here is a size one, this is a size three. They actually have kits where you can get, it's like a sizing kit that has size one, two, and three in it, and you can try it out. And here's the actual device. It's kind of like a little springy device. It's not solid. It's kind of like empty, an empty little springy device. I should have... In this demonstration, I should have um, I should have squished it so you could see how squishy it is, but I didn't. But these are available at Target. They're available at our grocery store. So these are widely available and not very expensive. So there's a cystocele. Remember, that's the that's the bladder that's coming out. And now we have the poise impressa. So we're inserting it and generally you're going to insert kind of going back towards your tailbone and you want it to be in a good position there. So you want it to be high enough up that it's giving some support to that vaginal wall. And you don't, I don't find it to be very comfortable when it's right at the entrance of the vaginal canal. I like it to be higher. Now here is an example of what I personally experience with the Poise Impressa. So it does give me some medium support for a short term, but then I find that it kind of migrates. So it doesn't have very good stability for me. It moves, but I've had people say that they love it and it gives them a lot of support to that, um, that wall there. So great. Here is the device again and I'm holding a size three and I'm holding a size one so you can see that the size one is, is smaller and then here's a little demonstration now no you're not gonna see me <laughs> actually putting the poison pressa in but that's my reaction like ah, if I didn't if I needed some internal support and I didn't have anything else I would use a poison pressa but it's not gonna be my go-to when I need support because it doesn't function how I really want it to because it migrates and that's not comfortable so if you're out in the middle of an event or you're walking or whatever and this thing is migrating around um, it's just not a comfortable sensation for me Okay, now we have tampons. 
and you know how many tampon varieties there are in the world. So yes, I have the commercially available type with a plastic applicator. I find that it's so much easier to insert tampons with a plastic applicator. And this is what I've been using since I was in my teens. So I'm kind of a creature of habit as well. And I love, I love using tampons. So this is a super plus here on the left and that's what it actually looks like. And then this is a size ultra that I just learned about in the last couple months. And this is, this is what the ultra looks like. So from a width standpoint, it's a little bit, um, the girth is a little bit bigger on the ultra, but you can see that the length is a good bit, maybe 25% longer and tampons are easily available. So your grocery store, HEB, Walmart, wherever we are generally shopping in the US, uh, there are tampons, even at gas stations and little corner markets. Here again is our anatomy, and that's that cystocele where that bladder is kind of prolapsing down. I'm using a bladder prolapse for all of these demonstrations. And again, we're tilting that tampon towards the back and getting it high enough up there i probably would even position that a little bit higher in the vaginal canal but you're getting that high enough so that it that it provides support something to know with tampons i've had multiple patients over the years say i can't keep a tampon in and so personally tampons work great for me uh, for internal support but i know there are people out there that it doesn't work for and everybody is different and our anatomy is different so just understanding that you have options there are other things that you can try is empowering here we go with the tampons and again, you're not going to see insertion of a tampon, but here are the two sizes there. And I've been using a super plus for years and it works great. Now that, <laughs> now that I have the ultra, I like the ultra too. The ultra is great, but uh, super plus is generally uh, my go-to and I love it. So until all of my Super Plus tampons have run out, I'll be using Super Plus. And then at the point that they run out, and if I can find Ultra readily available, I'll probably use Ultra because it has that extra that, that extra length to provide extra support there for the length of the vaginal canal. But um, I don't notice a difference when I, when I wear either one in terms of support. And uh, just a little, just a little example for myself. So do I wear a tampon every day? No, I absolutely don't. I use tampons when I'm on my menstrual cycle. And then I'll use tampons occasionally if I am doing some big event where I need extra support for a short period of time. So let's say I'm uh, walking at an amusement park. I'm going to be there, you know, six hours. I'll put a tampon in and I'll use some external support to help um, externally but you know that happens maybe once a month maybe once every other month so very infrequently am I needing at this point in my life to use internal support as a supplemental uh, supplemental support and it also it also fluctuates based on how consistent I'm being with my exercises, I have to tell you. So sometimes, even though I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist, sometimes I'm not that consistent with my exercises. On the flip side, sometimes I'm very regular and very consistent. So it really varies based on my activity level, based on my training regimen, and based on what I'm doing. Okay, this is something that I just found out about in the fall. I was visiting my son, he was studying in Italy and this was pre-COVID. So I had the opportunity to go over there and get him checked in and so forth. And so I had met on Instagram a midwife in, um, it was in the Northern city. I don't remember what the city was called. I think it started with a T. Anyways, I was able to travel to her clinic. So I went to her midwifery clinic and she specializes in pelvic floor muscle training as a midwife in Italy. And she introduced me to this company called Contam. 
and uh, there is a company out of the United Kingdom that carries these products. So I ordered some, and here we have, you know, a range of sizes. So this is the largest that I purchased, but I think there was even a bigger size that I could have purchased. And they also had different shapes. So they had a cube, they had um, one that had ridges in it, and I don't remember the other options that they had, but basically there's a, a range of sizes, and these are considered to be temporary pessaries. So, Contam temporary pessary. All right, so again, here's our cystocele, that, that anterior vaginal wall isn't doing, isn't doing the job it needs to in terms of support, and it might benefit from a little extra support. So I have here just kind of giving you an example. So that's the Super Plus on the right, that's the Ultra Tampon, and then those are the four sizes of the Contam. So you can see the difference. And we have the Contam going in and supporting, and we'll go over all the different sizes here. So that was the smallest that I had, and then this was medium. And then this next one is large. And then the next one will be ultra, uh, extra large. Something to keep in mind with these devices is that they are, I don't know what kind of, I don't know what kind of material it is, but you'll see in this next video that when I tap them together, you'll hear them. And that's a vibrator. So that's just to give you an example of how big it is. Because you might think, oh my goodness, is it too big to put in my vaginal canal? Well, it's uh, it's not too big if you can tolerate a penis or a vibrator that's of a penis size. Okay, so going back to the material. This material requires that you soak it in water a couple minutes before insertion. So this is like a hard kind of material. And you'll hear when I kind of tap them together that you hear them kind of clacking together. Well, that's hard and dry. You don't want to put that into your vaginal canal. So again, make sure you're following manufacturer's guidelines, but soaking it in water first is what you need to do. Okay, so here is the live can you hear that? I don't know if you can hear that. I'm going to rewind it because I was talking at the same time too. So let's replay that. Here are two. So you can hear how hard it is. They're kind of knocking against each other. And then these were the two that I actually tried out. So you soak them in water and they're quite squishy with that. And so I was going to try to demonstrate inserting <laughs> this into a fake vagina, but it was very difficult. It was very difficult. So I ended up actually, I think, giving up. But that being said, it provided, they provided a good amount of support so on the rare occasion that maybe a tampon I might want more support than a tampon I could use uh, one of these devices I think it's a nice option to have and it's very much like a tampon just a little bit bigger and a little a little squishier okay sponges this looks terrifying, doesn't it? It's so big on the screen. And then here's a sea sponge. So again, this would probably, um, this might work for some people and this might work for some people. I actually myself ended up cutting this sponge in half and using it and you can, um, you know, insert it into the vaginal canal and it can provide some good support there. This I didn't actually end up um, trying. It it was really um, well. Number one, I think I was getting fatigue at trying everything, and then it was just kind of difficult for me to um, squish it around to try to insert it. So. You know, it's quite squishy and I was trying to twist it to see if I could insert it and I just didn't want to. So I have it so if I ever want to try it, but you can see that that, um, that is definitely taking up quite a bit of space there, but it's very, very soft. So for from what I could see, I think insertion 
and um, taking it out might be some of the biggest hurdles there. And then we have a quick little demonstration there. And like I was saying, like I tried to twist it around <laughs> and I just really couldn't figure out a way that worked for me to insert this today. Okay, menstrual disc. So this is another type of period product. It's a very flexible little disc with a little cup there to um, catch, the, catch the blood. So you kind of squish it in half and then you insert it into the vaginal canal. And then once it's in there, it kind of pops out and then it would sit there. I personally don't use these. I don't find them to have good stability for me. They don't stay where I want them to stay. So that's not something that I use, but I have had people that have said that, uh, especially if they have a milder grade, like a grade one sometimes or a grade two, that that menstrual disc gives them um, some support there. And so that might be an option to try. And I believe those are easier to access, like either in Walmart or your grocery store. Okay, so again, it doesn't work for me, but that doesn't mean that it won't work for you. So there's that example again. And again, I was going to try to insert into the vaginal, a fake vaginal canal. It was just difficult. It was difficult. So um, <laughs> I gave it a thumbs down because I don't personally like it. But again, you may find it to be helpful for you. Okay, so here's a big one, menstrual cups. There are so many different sizes and shapes and options out there. And this is a very eco-friendly, environmentally friendly, friendly option. Uh, so basically they're kind of made out of this pliable plastic or I, I actually don't know what material it is, but maybe it's silicone, but it's squishy, squishy material and you wash it and reuse it. I think, um, again, follow manufacturer's guidelines, but I think, uh, it might be recommended to boil them, but again, follow the guidelines. So with insertion, you kind of fold it up and insert it into the vaginal canal and then it pops open and it provides some support there. So again, some people find this to be helpful. I would say the people that I have heard that it was helpful for prolapse were milder prolapses. I, again, personally don't find this to be helpful for support. If I want to use this, I might use it at night while I'm lying down, but this is not an option that I'm gonna use during the day because it's just not stable. And I've used four different kinds. Is there a cup out there that might work for me? It's possible. So if you're a menstrual cup designer and you have a fabulous one that might help with pelvic organ prolapse, you know, I'm happy to try it out. But so far I haven't tried any that, uh, that I found helpful. I, I have a friend that actually told me that she has one that's a little stouter and I think it's a little bit shorter. And she actually cut the bottom of that off and it's giving her some support. So again, some people might find it helpful, but I, I have multiple direct messages and multiple of my patients in the past have said that you know a menstrual cup just won't stay in place and it's quite difficult or, or impossible to use with prolapse. Okay. Something important to discuss is that when you're taking that menstrual cup out, you don't wanna just pull it out by that little, um, that little button or that little knob. You want to reduce that vacuum or pressure. So it, did you see what I did right there? I kind of pressed against the wall to collapse it first and then bring it down. Because if you're pulling it straight down and it has a nice amount of vacuum in the vaginal canal, does that actually cause prolapse? I haven't seen any research on that, but I can't imagine that it's good for those organs to be creating that vacuum from below. 
and it certainly I don't think is comfortable. All right, now we are on to Pezzeri. So these are reusable devices. These are generally fit by um, like a GYN physician. And, but again, there are physiotherapists in different parts of the world that are doing these fittings. But whether you fit them or not, being able to identify a patient that might be appropriate. In the past, these have been, there's been this stigma that only older people use these that weren't eligible for surgery. In fact, I had a personal experience about three years ago where I went to my GYN for my annual assessment and I said, hey, I would like to get a pessary. And he said, oh no, you're not old enough yet. You don't need that. But hey, what about surgery? I was like, no, 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 no. And I felt bad like I didn't push him on it I didn't say oh yes I want a pessary I know younger people are using it and people that are active I just kind of rolled my eyes internally and I switched doctors so um, maybe not the best approach but that's how I handled it so here's the pessary and these are a little bit difficult to negotiate getting inside I personally, with these two pessaries that I have in this demo, I did not find that I liked how they felt and I didn't find that they stayed in a good stable position for me. That doesn't mean that there isn't a pessary out there for me. I haven't personally been fit yet by a GYN. I actually had an appointment during COVID and I ended up quarantining for the last two weeks, so I had to cancel that appointment. But I still have it on my radar that I'd like to get fit for a pessary because I want to, I want to see someone that is skilled and has fit a lot of different uh, female bodies with a pessary. So you know, identifying what my um, deficiencies are, or where where I need extra support, and then finding a device that works great for me. I'd like to try it out. Okay, so now let's let's look at that. Look at the pessaries. It's just a little bit more difficult to to negotiate these, as you can see. And there are pessaries that are left inside for three to four months. And so this would specifically be like for the older population that may not have the dexterity uh, to be able to change these out and clean them and then reinsert them. They will go back to their provider periodically to get um, the pessary changed out. And so that's one option. But then I also know there's people out there that put this in right before they go on a run and then they take it out afterwards. They don't need it all day long, every day. They just need it for specific periods of time when they have increased activity. There was an interesting research showing that partners prefer the pessary to be out during penetrative vaginal intercourse, <laughs> which I thought it was interesting that that was included in a research study. But yes, I think that would feel better. Okay, now we have an inflatable pessary. And so my goal was actually, I had envisioned myself trying this out, but kind of like that pink sponge, I had just had enough of trying things out today. <laughs> so I didn't actually try this out yet, but it's important to know that this is an option out there. And this is what it looks like. So this is deflated and it's inserted into the vaginal canal. And there's this little button, this little ball. And so you slide the ball down. It's important to make sure you know how to use it first. And then you pump it up. So I'm pumping it up and there it is inside. And then you take the little pump off and you slide the, slide the ball up. <laughs> and then it would stay. And then it would stay in there. So now to remove it, you would move the little ball and then this is the part that actually worried me a little bit. Like, how does it deflate? There's not, uh, so really experimenting with how it's used, I think is, is very important. <laughs> and it was terrifying. It was a little scary. And then you can see me pumping it up again here in a different view. 
but this might be a good option for some people. <laughs> but for me, again, it wasn't. It wasn't on my list today. So you can see that this was not on my list to do today. Well, it was on my list and then I got scared. So uh, that is not something that I tried out. Here's a little video demo again of pumping it up. So inserting that, moving the little ball, pumping up the device, and then moving the little ball back. My biggest question was, you know, how do you deflate it? And that was a little a little scary. Okay, so here is a demo using a fake vagina. So that's a that's a vagina. And I have coconut oil. I needed an extra set of hands for this demonstration. <laughs> so basically, I generously lubricated the device with coconut oil and then I insert the device into, you know, you see how I kind of folded it so that we could insert it, insert it into the vagina. It was a little challenging. And then we have the little inflatable thing. So I wanted to show you with this demonstration what it's actually doing inside. And so you can see that ball is inflating in that fake vaginal canal. And again, this might be a really good option for some people. I, I am not at the point that I would, um, I'm not at the point that I would recommend this for someone and typically, you know, uh, this would be for pretty severe forms of prolapse. And it was very difficult to get it out to. So <laughs> that was the demonstration with the inflatable pessary and I'm still working on removing it. Yes, got it out. Okay, let's go over a few myths and then a few tips and then we're gonna be done for today. So myth number one, nothing major happens to the pelvic floor muscles during pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Not true. Here is the pelvis from below. So that's the vaginal opening and the baby and you can see this incredible stretch that happens to the pelvic floor muscles. And then here are perineal tears. So this is a sketch of the perineum. This is, these are the labia majora, the labia minora, that's the vaginal opening, the urethra opening, this is the anus, and then this is the perineal body that stretches from the vaginal opening back to the anus. So this is a grade one tear, so just a minor tear there. A grade two, the pelvic floor muscles are torn. A third degree goes all the way to the anus, pelvic floor muscles are torn, and then a fourth degree going all the way into the rectal canal, and definitely the pelvic the floor muscles are torn now and major damage. So the pelvic floor muscles are a special group. They stretch between 1.62 to 3.78 times their resting length. The majority of recovery occurs within the first six months. So it's not six weeks, is it? It's six months. So allow your body time to heal and recover. And then 12 months, the pelvic floor muscles resemble those immediately after a C-section. Myth number two, the pelvic floor muscles automatically return to normal. So for some people, it may seem like that, um, and they may actually, but many people require rehab and uh, time and attention to help a full, a full and successful recovery. Myth number three, all internal support options cost a lot of money. That's not the case. So you saw some of those options that we went through are not expensive. Myth number four, all internal support options give the same level of support. Not the case. Some of them are very squishy and flexible and small, and some of them are bigger and more substantive. So it um, definitely varies. Myth number five, 
Internal support option, internal support is the only option for pelvic organ prolapse or perineal descent. Not the case. So remember, we went over those interventions. And again, don't forget pelvic floor muscle training. That's a huge, huge uh, intervention that has been shown to be very effective. All right, tip number one, choose what works best for you, but consider support versus comfort. So you want it to be comfortable, but you also want it to be supportive enough and play around with different devices and different levels of support to see what works best for you. Tip number two, internal support should provide enough counter force, but should not be painful. So remember the forces from above, the forces from below. And so this device is in there providing support from below. And so it needs to provide enough support, but also should be comfortable and not painful. Tip number three, the support you choose may vary based on your chosen activities. So like myself, I might use something only once every month or once every other month on you know certain occasions, or some people may use it when they go running, or you may need to use it when you're working. Uh, so it really just depends on you. But most of the time, you're going to need the support when you're up and active. And there are some pretty cool options to help you be up and active. Tip number four, the, the support you choose may vary based on your needs and your symptoms. Again, so symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse vary. They vary in the same day. So you may have no symptoms in the morning, but you have symptoms in the afternoon. Okay, we'll use some support then in the afternoon when you need it. That's okay. You may have no symptoms except right before your cycle. Okay, that's all right. Just kind of identifying when you need support. And it's not, um, it's not a negative thing to, to need support. So, uh, do, do we view it negative that we need to wear bras to help support our breasts? No, that's not a scary, awful thing to use bras. So why is there a stigma about using different devices to help support our pelvic organs? <laughs> Let's reduce that stigma together and talk about it. And then our last tip, tip number five, combined internal and external support may be helpful. If you're watching this video, I strongly encourage you to check out the other video that I made on external support options because I go through a lot of different samples and trials and sh share with you what works and what doesn't possibly for me. So um, in summary, the YouTube caption, I will include websites and links to these products. If you have any questions or there's anything that I didn't cover, here's how you can reach me, Janice at mypfm.com. I'm on Instagram at my pelvic floor muscles, or you can go to mypfm.com. Thank you so much for your engagement and for staying with me today. I know this last little uh, part, I kind of flew by. Basically, I'm in my basement and my son had a meeting on Zoom and it was supposed to last a little bit longer. He's 20. And then <laughs> he came down in the middle of the internal support presentation. So I've kind of whipped through the last part. Um, but I, you know, such is life. Thank you again. And that's a life of having a pelvic floor physical therapist as a mother. Take care. Bye-bye.